Uh, in, in case of anything, I'm able to, to share with those that will need to listen to our conversation today. I hope that is okay with all of us. Yeah, let me have your thumbs up if that is okay with you. Let me have your thumbs up if that is okay with you. You are saying our hands up? Thumbs, thumbs up if it's okay for me to record uh, what okay, we are fine. discussing today. Yeah, it's so okay, Dr. Arvid. Yes, it's thanks. Okay. Yeah, I have seen quite a number of you have said it's okay. Yeah, yeah. That, that is very good. Yeah, uh, I'm actually doing this for the love of my country. Uh, the fact that I'm in Canada studying does not mean I stop being a Kenyan. Even if I will later on want to be a citizen in Canada, I'll still be Kenyan. And the main aim of uh, wanting to do what I'm doing is because uh, just like the Bible says, uh, people perish because of lack of knowledge, lack of information. Uh, many of us could have uh, had these opportunities early in time if there was somebody who was ready to freely share with us what it takes to be out of the country, out of Kenya, uh, what it takes to study abroad. Yeah, because when I came to look at uh, the portfolios of most of the people who are uh, great leaders in our country, I realized that most of them, in, uh, at one time in life, they had gone outside the country to study or to do something outside the country. So uh, that gave me the inspiration to really want to get out of Kenya and uh, have something extra beyond Kenya in my, in my resume. So when I'm talking to people about, about um, uh, what I'm doing and how I'm doing it, it, is, uh, it adds value when, when, I, when I'm, 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 I'm talking about having studied in a country like Canada, which is respected when it comes to matters education. And I believe uh, with the competencies I picked from my country, that is Kenya, uh, if I add to what I'm now getting or what I'll be getting in Canada, I'll be able to assist my own country to be a better country when it comes to matters education. As I had actually told you, uh, those who attended the meeting uh, last Sunday, I came over with my children. Why? The main reason as to why I came with my children is because I wanted my children to have an honest and a quality education because I believed I was giving my best to my country. So if my children got the best, then uh, together maybe later, we can be able to, to, to work together with the people who are willing to transform Kenya. Because in Canada, uh, the competency-based learning that we are talking about in Kenya, it is very practical in Canada. Children don't train, yeah? Children don't train. Sunset in Canada is at 8 p.m. So sunrise is 8 a.m., sunset is 8 p.m. So our children uh, wake up at eight. The buses are ready to pick them to go to school uh, as, as from a very short distance. So they leave our houses at uh, five minutes to the time when the buses arrive at the bus stations. And so they don't have to struggle. And <laughs> they actually wake up at seven to prepare themselves, yeah? Uh, so the, the children, I mean, children are so relaxed. And this is a country that uh, really respects children. Uh, education for children is free. Like now I came on a study permit uh, my children were given study permits. So when they get to the country, you, are, you, you, you tell the government where you are living or where you'll be living, and then your children will be placed to schools just next to your home. 
So school buses will come at a scheduled time to pick your child, uh, take them to school and bring them back home. Believe me, even on the first day, I, there is no time I went to that school to find out how it looks like, how, you know. I was just given a schedule. Your children will be picked uh, on this day at this time. And that was it. When children came back home, they were now telling me the stories, how their schools are nice and, you know, it is such, such an amazing thing. So as a parent of the school now, maybe later I can request to visit the school so that I can get to, 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 to see the administrators, know how they do things because I'm an educator. I, but I, I love everything about Canada. As I told you earlier, Canada is an, a, 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 a country that works on trust. It's so amazing that when you go to the shopping malls, that is one thing that still surprises me up to today. So I keep on going to different malls to confirm that it is true, that you just get to the mall, pick what you want, you go to the machine, uh, the cashier machine, you just scan your items, and then you're given your total, you put your, your card there, you pay, you pack your things in your bag and you go. I mean, there is nobody checking whether you scanned everything or you didn't scan. Yeah? As in, people just trust that people are doing the right thing. And that is what we need to embrace in uh, our country when it comes to values, value-based education. Uh, as in, uh, the citizens in Canada have got values. They've really, I, I mean, as in, you just trust them. They, yeah, they're just trusted. When they see anybody, they trust that person, that that person will just do the right thing. So uh, it is a challenge that I am getting, and I'm actually wondering what I will do later on in life to come back and and see it, that this is affected in our country. Though uh, we usually say where there is a will, there is a way. And uh, when you know there is something you can do to make a difference, don't, don't sit on that thing. Go ahead and do something about it. Don't just keep quiet. So had I just uh, sat back and said I'm comfortable as a national facilitator in Kenya or then I couldn't have experienced what I'm experiencing in Canada. And I believe in a very short while, I'll get connected to the educators in the country and I will get a position that uh, will be able to help me learn more in the process of studying. And uh, yes, for sure, I will always bring it back home. So you will be informed, you will, um, you will you will be informed on how to, to do it right because i have uh, quite a number of friends now who are ready to join me to support you to get the right information not just for canada even to go to australia to go to america and other countries but the best countries to study in are uh, canada and australia because systems are actually working. If you come to study, you have to study. I mean, there is no shortcut about it. Like I came to study, I have to go to class and study. However, I'm given a study work permit that I can work when I'm free and I can also study uh, as scheduled, yeah? So it is a country where you are expected to be self-disciplined. Now, somebody is asking, uh, some, somebody is asking if the process is, uh, how long does the process of application that takes? It is about you having the right things in the process of applying. You need to know what you need to have when you start the ap ap application process. Like, um, because I had a sister back in Canada who, was, who had prepared me psychologically what I need to to, to look for. So I looked for all those things before I started the process of doing what? Of uh, applying for the, for the program. That is after getting the admission letter. 
So of course, the first thing you need to do is to ensure that you have a passport, a valid passport. Uh, uh, that will take you some time. Yes, of course. Don't, don't if your your passport is almost uh, uh, whatever ring. Uh, what is it called? You need to renew so that you have a passport that will give you some years uh, that you can maybe uh, extend your stay in Canada or in the country that you want to go to. Uh, I'm doing this as I wait for Dennis. Dennis, please, if you get to the room, let me know. Diana and Dennis, uh, please let me know so that we don't waste a lot of time. Uh, Dennis, are you in the room? Yes, I think I have seen you. Unmute, Unmute yourself. The rest, the rest of us, please mute. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dennis. It is so interesting, my people, to be in uh, a, a, another place other than Kenya. I came to realize that uh, the state where I'm living, that is Ontario, is larger, is bigger than Kenya. But the systems are working. Transportation, everything. I mean, everything is just so amazing. The people are good. Somebody was telling us that, oh, there is racism and what have you. No, I've not experienced any. When I go to church, I'm just treated like a human being. I am loved like any other. When I go to the malls, our Zungu, they are ready to support you anytime. Yeah, I think they're just there. To, if, you, if they see you like you're looking stranded, they will just come and ask you, uh, is there anything we can do to help you? I wish we could do that in Kenya. I mean, it is just an amazing country to, to really want to come. However, as I told you, my course is self-sponsored. My course is self-sponsored and it's very expensive. That is why I went an extra mile now to start thinking like, now that I have friends, how can I ask them to help me? And that is why I very first thought of, oh, what if I came up with a group, then I get people to support me, raise my fees. So I want to welcome Dennis and Diana uh, to say hi to us. These are serious guests. They are in the field of what I'm talking about. I mean, take your time, listen to them, take notes, ask questions. And uh, when they will not be available, I'll continue giving you my stories because my stories are, are many. Oh, so Dennis, where are you? Please say hi to hi. the team. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, Dennis. Yes, Dennis, we okay, can perfect. hear you. So, um... Mami, thank you so much for organizing this meeting. Um, I'm really happy to be part of this. I will just allow me to call you mom because yes. you're our mother and uh, <laughs> it will be a great mistake to, to call you with your name. And uh, But I really appreciate that so much. Thank you so much. When I heard about uh, this meeting, I said, uh, uh, it doesn't really matter what it takes. I'll just try as my, my level best to be here. Uh, so it is 1 a.m. here in Australia. Mm -hmm. But I said, I'll just sleep a bit, then wake up for the meeting. And so here I am, and I really am really grateful. Oh, so okay. thank you so much for, for you organizing this meeting. And thank you so much for everyone who has joined. Uh, my name is Dennis Otieno, uh, Abonji. Um, and uh, I'll, before I even continue, I want to, um, you know, have my wife to introduce herself too, because, yeah, so maybe, maybe where are you? And just introduce yourself first before you continue. Uh, hi, everyone. Hi, Dan. Hi. I thank you so much uh, for this meeting. Madam Christine, being a dear teacher to me, back in high school and now we are here that we have to help each other achieve our goals and dreams even as we move forward. I and Dennis, Dennis is my husband, he's in Australia, I'm in Kenya. We are co-directors in a company that we assist students study in Australia majorly, self-sponsored to say, it's called Mashariki Exposure. 
And uh, when Madame shared with us, we thought it's wise if we just share some of the nuggets that we have with you people, so that even it's not you who is going to join uh, the study group in Australia, maybe it will be your children, it will be your sister, someone who you know, who will want to study in Australia. And that's why we said it's noble if we are here just to assist each other. And I'm so grateful that we are here. I'll hand over to my husband so that he can give us a few nuggets. And where we have questions, we are, we are always here to serve you, to listen to you and to answer your questions at, as God enables. And this far, we just want to thank God. Thank you, Madam Christine, for taking a step higher and going ahead so that we can have some of these tips that you're giving us which also inspires us to get better. Thank you so much. And back to you, Dennis, kindly. Okay, so thank you so much. Um, so first of all, um, I am currently based in, uh, as, as I said, I'm based in Australia, in uh, Brisbane, uh, which is in Queensland, which that is the state. And uh, honestly, uh, what I've heard from, uh, from mom initially is exactly the same thing that is happening here. Like it is a beautiful place to be in. It's, a, it's an amazing place. The systems are working and all those things. But um, I would want to, first of all, just go through a bit of how to get here because for you to experience all these things, there's definitely a process. And one thing I can assure you guys is that, you know, there's no shortcut. That's the first thing I would want just to make very clear. There's no shortcut in doing these things because we are dealing with countries where really systems work and they're very serious when it comes to issues of integrity, issues of, um, you know, just doing things right. So uh, um, uh, I'm privileged enough because I've been in the industry for, uh, in, the, in the international education, I've been an international education consultant for the past nine years now. So I started working in this job as uh, in 29, 20, 2012, 2015, sorry. And this is basically the only thing I've been doing all my life, assisting students to achieve their dreams of coming to study abroad. So I started as um, in employment. I worked with the various companies by the grace of God. Uh, by the grace of God, I was able to, you know, be promoted and, uh, I've served in several capacities in the same industry, like uh, regional manager and all that. Then eventually God helped me to get into, you know, like working now as a consultant with, uh, with the university. So I'm privileged enough to have been able to work on an agency level and also as an, at an institutional level, whereby I was helping universities promote their products in Kenya and just maybe set up their presence in Kenya. So eventually I also worked with um, other institutions as a business development manager and uh, so many other things I've done by the grace of God. So when it comes to issues about promoting international education, uh, helping students to make that decision, how to select courses, what do the universities look at, what kind of uh, you know, like uh, paperwork they need, what exactly they, 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 they want from a student, I totally understand. And uh, I'm also uh, really grateful to God for the opportunity that now, even after doing all that in Kenya, I was able now to come to the same, to the, to the same country uh, and, uh, you know, now, now experience exactly what I was telling people. And that is a big privilege for me and I really am very grateful. So uh, when it comes to the whole process, uh, the first thing, as Madam uh, Mama has uh, rightfully said, you really you have to get, definitely get a passport, and there are a few other things, that, other documents that you need. And of course, I know most all of us can actually be able to provide those documentation. Like for instance, your KCSE certificate, your undergraduate certificate, meaning any diploma courses that you've done, or any bachelor's programs that you've done, uh, any employment uh, a, a, that you've done, a CV, a detailed CV. Those are now the basic documentations that we are going to be needing if we are going to start this process. However, uh, just having the documents is not, uh, you know, like it's not the only thing that we're going to be looking at. So from an institutional point of view, we, we because uh, especially I'll talk from the perspective of Australia, and of course, this is exactly also what will happen in Canada because Australia and Canada are just siblings. 
they share quite a lot of things, but their systems are a bit different because I've been able also to assist students to transition to Canada. So I understand exactly what happens in Canada and also in Australia. So um, the school is going to be looking at what are you, what did you study before? So let me give an example. Um, I, uh, I personally studied Bachelor of, uh, so I started with a diploma. I did a diploma in purchasing and supplies management, went to campus, did a bachelor of, uh, of um, I did a bachelor in, uh, in business management, see, uh, aviation option, then worked in the industry, in the international education industry. Eventually when I was making the decision to come to Australia, there's no way I could have been able to do a master's of, of nursing. And this is simply because that nursing is not related to what I'm doing or what I did previously. So when it comes to doing the application, the school will be looking at what, and even the embassy, these are things they're gonna be looking at. What course did you do? And how is it related to what you're going to be doing in these countries? So um, that is a very important thing to start from. And then is the course right? Then if you're taking that, then that is perfect. So you cannot say you, are, you did a bachelor's of IT or did a diploma of IT, and then maybe went and worked uh, in a different industry. And you know th those inconsistencies sometimes will cause you problems. And unfortunately, because the way our Kenyan system is, you'll find that maybe you study even uh, education, you find yourself in the bank, which is not a problem. However, when we do the consultancy, that's when now as we come in as a Mashariki exposure, we're going to help you now. Okay, look at your papers and guide you and tell you this course is the one it's gonna be right for you because at least at the end of the day, you're going to meet the genuine, genuine temporary entrant criteria for a particular uh, university. And at the end of the day, we're also going to be looking at the genuine temporary uh, entrant criteria for the visa processing. So we are, we are going to guide you on that. So consistency in the, in the course is very important just to ensure that your process is successful. So that's something that we're going to be looking at. And this is something I want you also, as you maybe thinking about making the transition, you can also be looking at. So that's number one. Number two, um, you can only go to do something that is higher than whatever you've already ha you already have in, Ken in, in Kenya. So uh, for instance, um, in Australia, they're very strict on that. And in recent times, they've become even more strict on that issue because um, you, you've already done a diploma. You can only come and do a bachelor's in Australia. You've already done a bachelor's, you can come and do a master's. So you always have to go higher. Sometimes I get questions like, um, I've already done the, the bachelor's here, but because of financial uh, issues, my financial situation, can I be able to do a diploma which is cheaper? Unfortunately, might not happen that way uh, and of course people have, have tried to cut cut the system but then at the end of the day they get caught because some have gone into even to an extent of maybe uh, fabricating papers and all but then it has never worked for them because uh, you know the, the system just will catch up with them somehow so you can always go and do you should always go and do something that is higher than what you have already done and then uh, after that, of course, uh, there's a process you have to, we will look at your documentation. This is just the basic stuff. We, are, we, we have not even started doing the application yet. We're just looking at the course. We're just looking at uh, your papers. We're looking at which level have you are you at. So just to ensure that you increase your chances of even getting the admission letter, everything has to be right. And then the final thing that I'll mention about the whole thing is that you have to try and see how to cover any gaps that you have within uh, your, your, you know, your look, like in your, in, your, in, your, in your profile. What gaps am I talking about? So assuming um, you finished your high school in uh, maybe 2014, or maybe let's say in, yeah, let's give it 2014. I'm just giving this as an example. And then between 2014 and maybe 2020, there's really nothing to show what exactly you've been doing. There's a high chance that you might not be able to get a chance because they'll be asking themselves between this time, what have you been doing? So in Australia, they have been very sensitive in the sense that if you cannot even be able to account for two years, you know, in between, I've seen even cases whereby 
a student finished their high school, you know, like maybe in, 20, in 2020, and then they didn't do anything up to 2022. When you're doing the application, it becomes a bit challenging. They will start querying where did the student, where was the student within these two years? Or even sometimes even one year, they will want to query and see and understand what were you doing during those years. So when before even you were, as you are looking at your papers, we always try and uh, we always try and we'll guide you on how to, you know, cover that gap and to ensure that you know, like you, you, have, you have a very strong profile as we are sending to the, to the school. There are also other documentation that you're going to be required, but this is going to be on case to case basis. However, uh, the basic documents that you must have are your passport, of course, your ID, you must have your academic documentation and they have to be, you know, like the genuine academic documentation and all of them, and even sometimes I always encourage students to bring even those, you know, the, those small courses that you might think are just small courses. Sometimes it is on job training certificates. Please, you also have to provide those ones. They just help somehow. Um, and then um, employment letters and a detailed CV because they're going to be looking at the CV just to see if they, they, all the gaps have been covered. And then the other document that might be asked and uh, this is, of course, on case to case, depending on the school, will be a bank statement. But I always say that just, you know, for the purposes of making this whole thing, uh, just go well, uh, be ready to, you know, prepare a bank statement for that. And then uh, there's going to be something called a statement of purpose, or, uh, uh, or it's called a statement of purpose in Australia. Sometimes it's called a letter of intent, uh, letter of intention. In other, in other cases. So if this is just basically a document that you are writing. It's like more of an essay. essay, you explaining to the school or to the embassy. And of course, when it comes to the embassy level, you have to prepare a statement of purpose. So uh, this, 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 this statement of purpose is basically a document that will help the, the, the admission team or the, the case officer who's going to be handling your visa to understand where are you coming from, your, your history, of course, you're going to talk about your academic history, your professional history, and then your research on the institution that you're going to go, go into, your research on, uh, on the country. So like generally, why would you be interested to go to Canada? Why would you, would you be interested to go to Australia? What kind of research have you done about that, those two countries or with, with, depending whichever country you're going to go to? And then they're also going to want to see uh, the, the, the relationship between your course. That's why I'm saying it is very important that we do the things that are right in the first time. So they want to see you did a bachelor of business uh, why are you, why are you uh, coming here to do a master of education, for instance? So getting a reason why you're going to do that switch sometimes can be a bit of a challenge. But if, for instance, you did a bachelor of business and you're going to come and do a master of business, it is very easy for you to get reasons why you'd want to do such a thing. So that's why having a consistent course is it's very important. So you'll explain why you're going to do that course, what benefits are are, are you going to get from that or studying in that particular country from that course? And then eventually you're going to explain your future plans. So what plans do you have after finishing that particular course? In that statement also, this is where you'll declare your financial capability to study. You know, like if for instance, you'll, you'll, you'll say where your source of financial finance is, and of course, uh, the benefits that you're going to get in the future, what are your future plans? And in most cases, even if, for instance, you're going to wish to study or to stay in the country longer, you will not say it that you want to stay in the country. You'll have to say that, you know, like I am coming to Australia. Can you hear me? Somebody is saying volumeless. Can, can you guys hear me? You are audible. You are okay. Yeah, you. Okay. Yeah, we are perfect. able to hear you. We are able to hear you. You are yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Right. We can hear you. We hear you. Okay, yeah. thank you yes, so much. We are getting much. you well. You are getting you well. Perfect. Thank you so much for that. So, um, so basically, I was saying 
in that statement of purpose, you are, you cannot say that uh, I wanted to come to Australia and then I would want to stay there for forever. You know, I, then look for opportunities there. You know, you'll always have to explain and say that I want to come and then um, I want to come back home and you know improve my life and all those things. So basically, that is just the basic uh, stuff. So of course, once the documents are ready, we'll be looking at that. We'll be guiding you. We'll be able to guide you on the the the, the, the university, which university is best for you, which state is going to be right for you, and all that. And in Australia, we have different states. We have uh, Western Australia. We have like um, five states and two territories. And uh, so it will just depend where well, I will be able to guide you on, on whichever one is best for you. And we'll tell you the benefits of living in that place and all that. And the, you know, the beauty about it is that I'm already here. I know a bit of uh, a, a bit more about the, the, these different places. By the grace of God, I've also traveled to other states. So I know I'll, I'll be able to guide you on exactly what is needed. So my team and I will compile it. My team will compile all your documents, submit an application to, to the school. It takes, the, the, the application processes might, might take a bit long because, um, uh, so I'll, I'll address everything, the cost and everything. So just be patient. I've seen that uh, issue about the cost. So we'll submit an application for you. It, the application process takes for, for, for from the time of sending the application to maybe the time of getting the offer letter. It can take a month, a month and a half, sometimes two months because they will go through every single document that we send. So that's pretty much it. So we will get a, a, a letter, an offer letter that offer letter can be either conditional or unconditional. A conditional offer letter is a, a letter that maybe they require more information from you. So for instance, maybe they will ask for uh, English, uh, the English exam, uh, proof of English proficiency. And I'll talk about that because this is not something that all students must have, but at the end of the day, it is something that is a very important document that will help you even get opportunities while you're on ground. So English proficiency is, uh, we can do several uh, tests to prove English proficiency and English proficiency would be, and of course, remember, as we are going, we are, going, we are doing this discussion of your course and all these things, we also tell you if this course will need English proficiency or not. So that's why I didn't include it as a, as a basic document because it is on a case-to-case -case basis. So, but at the end of the day, I'll, as a general rule of thumb, I will encourage you as you're thinking of doing this process, please do those English proficiency tests because they will open doors for you when you're on ground. So English proficiency tests, some of them that you can be able to do for the purposes of migrating abroad are TOEFL, there is IELTS, that is in international English uh, testing, language testing system that is offered by either British Council or um, or or uh, uni, uh, uh, I forget the other country that, that that provides that. So we have TOEFL, we have IELTS, and we have PTE. So those are the three proficiency courses that you can be able to do. There's another one, but that one is specifically for those people who would want to do nursing. And I will also answer, there's a question about nursing that has come up. So for nursing programs and social work programs, you have to provide English proficiency. That one is a must upfront. There's no debate about that. And you have to get very high scores but in the English proficiency. So social work and nursing are must like, you just have to, before even we start the process, we must have already provided the IELTS and you have to get uh, at least a 7.0 or 7.5 out of nine for you to be able to get into a nursing program or a social work program. So that's pretty much it. So I've said we are at, um, uh, I'll talk about everything, even education and all that. So um, I'll talk about all those things. So, um, so we, uh, I'm at that point of conditional and condi unconditional and conditional offer. So you get a conditional offer, you have to provide additional documentation or additional information. If you get an unconditional offer letter, then you might um, uh, you might you might you might uh, you might be needed. Uh, you if you get an unconditional offer letter, then you would just go to the next step of paying your tuition fee. So 
Um, let me talk about, uh, uh, I'm, I'm now into the finances now. So um, when it comes to coming abroad, unfortunately, of course, there are, uh, there are opportunities of you getting scholarships. But when it comes to Australia specifically, I'll talk about Australia. I don't know about Canada. Mom will, will help us when it comes to Canada. But best from, from where I sit, from where I sit, because I've done, I've worked with institutions and I've also worked at the agency level. What I know is that getting scholarships is not the easiest thing. And... Um, um, and simply because, especially in Australia, for instance, education is their third largest uh, export. They are, you know, like it's the, it's the third largest income earner for the country from, you know, like, you know, the education, a lot of foreigners are coming to Australia to study. So, and I'll talk about the benefits after I finish this, after I finish what I'm saying. So, Getting scholarships is not the easiest thing because, you know, if they give scholarships, you know, scholarship basically is not as if you're, you, you're, you're being given for, for free. There's someone somewhere who is catering for your schooling so that you can be able to study, you know, that's basically, that's basically why there's a scholarship. So someone is footing your bill. So if they do that, then automatically they're losing income. So that is why in Australia, Yes, you can get scholarships. However, they're not very easy to find. And um, just as uh, generally, you can also Google this. There's, uh, it's, there's something that is called the Australian uh, uh, Australian Award. I think it's something like that. That is a yearly scholarship that they give for participating countries and Kenya apparently is one of them. It is very competitive because in Africa, they only award it to around maybe 10 people. So you'll find that most cases, they give it to people who are going to do their PhD and not necessarily their master's or undergraduate because it's very competitive. And remember, um, they also want people, very smart people, so that they can be able to retain that kind of talent here. But if you get the Australian Award Scholarship, most likely you're supposed to come and study and go back to your country. So in what I've seen from my own research and what I've, what I've heard from even experts in the industry is that that Australian award mostly, especially from, from African countries, it will go and remember, it is only 10, 20 slots for the entire Africa. So com the, com the level of competition is super high. And in most cases, the people who actually get those scholarships are, um, are from, from our PhD students. So if you are doing, if you're looking to do your bachelor's or your master's, that might not be the best place to go and look for scholarships. And again, um, it's only 20 slots, you know, so, and you can imagine how many people we are, go are going to be applying. So it's, scholarships are not very easy. Some schools will give you partial scholarships. So partial scholarship, you're talking about 20%, 25%, 30%. Uh, when I was coming here, I was given a 20% scholarship and it's based on merit. You don't have to apply for that. It will automatically reflect on your offer letter when you get an offer letter. So they'll tell you by the virtual fact that you've gotten maybe a second class upper or your GPA was good, we're going to give you an international merit scholarship for 20% uh, or 25%. And that 25% is of the total of fee. But again, it is not necessarily... Uh, going to be like an uh, uh, like you're going to like 25 percent going to be slashed off from the initial uh, amount of money that you're going to pay it is going to be 25 percent broken down into small bits that uh, you know spread across your duration of study so it's 20 percent so meaning that the first semester maybe you're going to pay less two thousand five hundred dollars you know something like that so it's not going to be like 25 percent of the total then you slash it from whatever amount no it's going to be spread out just as a way of ensuring that also you continue with them as a, as a student. If they give you initially, you know, you, things will change and they are going to be losing. So they try and make it that. And of course, you, when you have to come here and perform well for you to get it for the next semester, that's how they've, they've structured it. So when it comes to scholarships, it might not be, it's not easy to get. Because remember, international education is 
a big honor for most of these countries, even Canada, I might, I might, I might, I might say. But that, that should not stop you from looking for these opportunities. From where we sit, unfortunately, we cannot be able to help you get scholarships because the kind of partners that we are dealing with do not really have scholarships or do not offer scholarships. As I said, the most they can do is a partial scholarship. So it's 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 not it's not gonna it's, it's not going to work out unfortunately. So um, that's when it comes to scholarship. But so but but look, just do your search. This shovening scholarship they normally uh, give out. Uh, Alex Chamwada is one of the uh, the most famous uh, beneficiaries of that scholarship. Uh, and a few other people that I know. So you can always check out, it's, it's offered every year. British Council offers a lot of scholarships. Uh, a lot of embassies, these foreign embassies also offer scholarships. So you can just go into their websites, try and see what scholarships they have been in, in, in UK, in uh, Australia, as I said, don't bother so much because here education is their biggest income earner. So most likely they're not going to give you so much scholarships, but they are still there. You can just Google and see. So from the scholarship point of view, I might not help you as much because we deal with self-sponsored students and, and self uh, uh, that's how basically we came here. I also paid my tuition fee and that's why I'm here. So when it comes to the cost, the tuition fee normally ranges between uh, 700,000 to even 1.3 million. And uh, this is basically, uh, uh, the, 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 in most cases, they're going to want you to pay uh, insurance, health insurance, and one semester tuition fee. So the, seven, the 700 to 1.3 million will cover your one semester tuition fee and insurance for the entire duration of time. Sometimes it's going to be maybe six months. I've seen in Canada, sometimes they will just want you to pay six months and then you're going to pay the rest of the amount while you're there. But in Australia, you have to, for instance, you're coming to do your master's for two years, you have to have insurance for two years. And that one is paid upfront with the tuition fee. So when it comes to the cost, at the, the biggest amount will go to your tuition fee. It, that's just from my experience, basically. So we're talking about between 800,000 to 1.2 million. As, as I'm saying that, remember, it's, it's simply because um, you know you're you're paying with the with the with the shilling, and sometimes the Kenyan shillings fluctuates based on the dollar. So it will just depend on that particular day. You might get that you will get a quotation of the same amount, let's say ten thousand dollars, but someone else will pay will pay less depending on the rate. Someone will pay more. So these things, please understand, they're also affected by what is happening in the financial markets. So that is something also you need to consider. So there's always going to be that. But at the end of the day, uh, that's basically it. So you pay your tuition fee, then you go to the next level, that is the visa processing. And here we also guide you on to prepare your documentation, draft your statement of purpose, and then we'll be able to sub help you submit the visa. And uh, as I said, they're going to be looking at those things that I mentioned earlier. They're going to be looking at the consistency, of course. They're going to be looking at, uh, of course, sometimes they also look at your age. So it, there's certain ages that we unfortunately cannot be able to process. However, that should not be a big issue so long as you have your, a good explanation to why um, you, 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 you want to study and there's, there's, there's consistency, there is... Um, there is the, you know, like you have proper papers, employment letters, and all those things, then age should not be a big factor. It can, we can always bypass that depending on the quality of, of documents that we be able to submit. And then um, I, I've seen someone asking about the green card. I'll just answer that very quickly. Uh, green cards are mostly offered in the US and that is something that you can easily apply when they're open. And in most cases, they open in November. Please try them out. I've also tried them out and I will still try. You know, there's really no harm in putting in an application. So that's very simple. You will, you just keep on checking the diversity something like you have to also be very careful because there's a lot of fraudulent links when it uh, associated with the green card so when they announce or when you know about it in most cases they normally open in november october so this year be on the lookout october november they're about just check out you can always google you can always maybe 
you, you will see them maybe advertise on the cyber cafe some somewhere. Someone will be able to. Um, uh, okay, someone will be able to assist you, and uh, so with the green card, that is just something you can be able to do. And of course, what I can say about the green card is, in recent times, they have changed the requirement. The long, uh, in the past, they didn't require a passport for you to apply, but recently, you have to have a passport. That's why a passport is a basic requirement when you're when you're thinking about opportunities abroad. So please have your passport. Even for the green card, you'll have to apply using that. And I have good friends who have gone to the US using the green card. And uh, it's something that is, is good, but the process is you have to apply, wait for you to be shortlisted. When the list is out, you're going to do an interview. And then after the interview is when now you can be able to go into the into US. So it is still a process. No one should tell you that once you've gotten the green card, it's a sure bet that you're going to the US. No, there's an interview that is going away, is going to be waiting for you uh, later on before they can actually allow you to get into the country. And um, also in, with the green card, you must you must also try and see if you can be able to get someone in the US so that they can be able to now assist you when you're doing your settling. Because sometimes they would also want to, to know who is going to like receive you on the other end. So that's basically about the green card. I might not mention so much about it because I've not done it myself, but I understand how it works. And please, these are things that you just try. Don't, you know, like there's no requirement, there's no, you know, big deal about it. Once this open, please, all of us, if it's possible, you just apply. You never know, you might be on that list. So that's it. So uh, I think I've covered the cost. So other associated costs are, uh, of course, you're going to pay for your visa application. You're also going to pay for medical tests. You're also going to pay for biometrics. And this applies to both Canada and, the, and, and Australia. And the US process is a bit different. Uh, I, I wouldn't want to mention that because as, ma as mom already told us earlier, the best places to go right now for, edu for, for, uh, for education and other opportunities are in Canada and Australia. So then you do your visa processing, you will wait for a duration of maybe two months, then your visa will be out, a, decision, a visa decision will be given Sometimes it will come earlier, sometimes it will come later, but at the end of the day, the best thing to do normally is to start this process early. So if you are targeting the February intake next year, this is the best time to start the process. Because as, as you have noticed, there's a lot of things in between that will, 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 you need to do. And also for the purposes of planning your finances, I normally believe that starting early is better. And then you can always get your visa early. And in Australia, they will allow you to come here even up to three months before your starting date. So you can imagine you're starting in February. In October, you're already in Australia. Then what does that mean to you? It means that you will settle well. You can be able to even start working to, to raise your tuition fee for the next semester, even before your actual semester starts. Then it means it gives you a, a better chance of you know, succeeding here because you have, sort, you have sorted out the culture shock issue. You have sorted out the financial beat. You have sorted out the issue of getting jobs because you land here. There's a few other things that you need to do for you to be able to get a job and all that. So you have already done all that within the three months or so. And then you can always start your course in good time and without any pressure. So that's just basically a rule of thumb that I normally say, please don't start now and you're targeting the July intake. That will be too much pressure. Yes, we can try our level best to get you in the July intake, but it will be too soon. It will be too much pressure and you, you'll just be torturing yourself psychologically. Let me talk about uh, teaching because I've seen that question coming up a lot of times. One thing I can tell you about the, uh, the, the teaching profession is that it will give you PR very fast. Permanent PR is permanent residency in Australia. So for teachers, this is your time. Like, I mean, it is indeed the best time to travel abroad because uh, apparently there's a big shortage, especially in Australia. When I, even when I was just landing, there was a lot of advertisement being done on TV and all the all media trying to get teachers. And um, uh, and uh, my wife is going to be, is, is, uh, my wife is going to talk about the, the English proficiency test. I'll give her a chance later. 
on how she does it because she she is the one in charge of English proficiency in our company. So I'll give her a chance later to talk about that. I've seen that question coming up. So please, uh, Darling, be ready to answer that question. So when, let me talk about education profession. Um, uh, so education is one of the highly sorted after careers in Australia. And as I was saying, as I was saying, when I was landing last year, that is one of those shortage, you know, like there was a, an acute shortage of teachers. Apparently, not so many Australians like teaching. And so they, they have a, an acute shortage of teachers here. So if you're a teacher and you'd wish to study abroad, please, this is your time because that shortage has not been met up to now, honestly, and they are needing teachers. However, for teachers, you have to also meet the very high English language proficiency test. Actually, education has a higher English proficiency test, proficiency requirement than nursing. Uh, but at the end of the day, once you get here, you will really, you know, like you'll be very highly sorted, sought after. Actually, education is one of those careers that you can actually do one year of study and honestly land, your, land a job even as you're studying and with a very good institution and even the government can help you and facilitate and all that. But there's of course procedures to that. It's not like as easy as I'm mentioning. There's a few other things that you have to meet first of all before, when you're here before you can be, you have to be cleared to work with children. You have to maybe do some placements at all. You have to go through a few other processes before you can be able to get a job. However, because of the shortage, that is a sure bet that you can actually land a job here when it, when it comes to, to teachers. Now, let me answer something that I know has come up and this is just generally, I'm going to answer that question, but then I'm going to answer it also generally. So someone might be asking themselves, I'm already a teacher right now. I've done teaching for the past maybe 10 years or so. Can I be able to just come to Australia and start teaching? Unfortunately, the answer is no we might not, you might not be able to do that. And even that applies to even engineers, as, as, as I've seen, someone is asking. And engineer is also, engineering is also one of the highly sought after careers in Australia. So how it works with the, with the Australian uh, system and, and, and job system, and based on, uh, of course, how I knew it and how, what I'm seeing currently, because I'm in the Australian system right now, I work with Australian companies right now is that you must have Australian qualifications for you to be able to work with in, in, a, in a professional job in Australia. What does that mean? You are a teacher, yes, you have experience, you have been working, you have, you have done your P, PPY, is, is, is it? Uh, I don't know, the, 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 the most basic, you've, you, let's, let me just say you have even done your master's in education or your bachelor's in education. You have maybe 10 years experience in Kenya and all those things, you have been registered by, by TSC and all those things. But unfortunately, you cannot just come to Australia to work. This is because uh, you have to get Australian qualifications for you to be able to get Australian jobs. Unfortunately, that is just how the system is. So you are an engineer, you have good experience in Kenya, all that, all that, but you still have to come and study in Australia for a certain duration of time. And in most cases, it's two years. And even in education, it has to be two years for you to be able to get Australian jobs. So, and master's program is uh, two years, a bachelor's program is three years. So unfortunately, job opportunities cannot be done. I'm not saying it is impossible for you to come. However, the easiest, fastest way to migrate normally is through education. And that's why you see a lot of people are coming as students, as opposed to just coming professionally. There are other different types of visas that you can actually come and, and start working, but that is a super long process. It's very costly. And uh, most it is, it is rarely do we get so many Africans coming in. And as uh, my, my mom was saying uh, initially, is that a person who has gone to the US and studied US in US and uh, wishing to come to Australia, it's going to be easier for them as compared to someone who's just studied in Kenya. So that's unfortunately is just the way the system is. And of course, another reason why we, we are disadvantaged as, as, a, as an African country is that uh, our the way that we do our training is a bit 
inferior as compared to what they are doing. Okay, inferior doesn't mean that we are not learned. Inferior doesn't mean that we are not. It's only that, you know, their curriculum is developed, it is developed differently. Mom told us that this competency-based system that is, is we are trying to implement in Kenya, they already implemented it almost like so many years ago. So it is well advanced, well structured, and all these things. And it's it it is the, 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 it is it is it's set in such a way that it's very easy for them to, you know, it is very dynamic in the sense that they can be able to change it depending on the change needs at, at, at the moment. So the career needs at the moment, they can be able to change them and 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 you know very fast. So that is basically the reason why we cannot come and work here directly. So uh, I hope I've answered that question. So, you know, like we can we be able to get work opportunities here. But the other thing is when you are a student and you're studying in Australia or Canada, mom already told us that she has a work permit. So she's allowed to work as you study. I am also working as I'm studying. And that is the beauty about these countries is that you can be able to be doing your schooling and you have to do your schooling even here. I personally have to go to class. Like tomorrow, I have a class on Tuesday and Wednesday. I have to attend my classes. They mark their attendance and all. And I have to, I can, I'm allowed to work. So it's just a matter of balancing and knowing exactly how I'm, I'm planning my time and all that. And um, because the system works, it is very possible. So we work even at night sometimes. You work during the day. You have to attend your classes. You have to do your assignments and all these things. But at the end of the day, you are allowed to work as you study. And remember, the beauty about it also is that you're going to get a minimum wage as compared to the other, the other Australians. So for instance, I'm being paid minimum wage as, you know, like, like, of course, like the minimum wage is set for everyone. It's equal. So like the, what the Australian will be paid is exactly the same what I will be paid. They don't discriminate. Yeah. Ah, okay, um, so we're talking about accommodation. Oh, Scholarships, yeah. I think I covered that pre pretty well. And then accommodation, it will just depend on what you're looking at. The, the, the different, there are different accommodations. So of course, I'm assuming you've already gotten your visa, you are coming here. One of those things we're also going to be helping you up uh, with is to identify accommodation uh, opportunity, uh, accommodation facilities for you. Of course, the schools offer accommodation on campus, uh, or uh, or they can offer you off-campus accommodation. But most people will prefer living outside the campus because it's cheaper. And I'm also personally living outside the campus. I've just rented my own house outside the campus. It's cheaper for me. It is the convenience of I can walk in and out anytime I want. And then, uh, um, and then. Uh, school accommodation is available, but in most cases it's very expensive. But it's not; it's a dorm kind of setup, so most people don't want it. If especially if, if you are a mature student, you're used to living with your own terms. You don't want a situation whereby the gates are locked. You know all these things and all that. And then just it, that is normally for young people. Uh, school accommodation. It's mostly for of course you can get for mature students, but that will mean you have to pay more for you to get a one bedroom or something like that. So accommodation, most people prefer staying outside. Yeah. And then uh, I was now talking about the opportunities. You are, you are here, you're paid minimum wage. It is, you, you're looking at the investment that you've put in. You have talked, so at the end of the day, by the time you're doing this whole process, most time you're going to have spent about 1.5, 1.6 million, because remember, I'm not talking about, I'm not touched on the ticket. And of course, before you do, you come, you have to pay your ticket. And this also fluctuates on price. That's why I cannot give an exact figure. But the opportunities that remains in the sense that you are allowed to work as you study, systems are working, no discrimination and all that. So you can actually be able to recoup your investment within a, a shorter duration of time as compared to if, for instance, you have taken that money and done something back at home. Of course, it just depends on what you what you want. But because the systems work, no discrimination at all, getting back this money can take you a short duration of time. At most one and a half years, you will have recoup back your investment. And then someone asked about coming with your family. It is possible that you can be able to migrate with your family. However, you, there's a minimum requirements that you have to meet for such. In Australia, if you want to come with your family, 
uh, assuming you're coming as a student, remember there's the financial bit to, to get a form. So when you're doing the visa, they will ask you to demonstrate that you have enough money for you to be able to cater for your own needs and also for your the person that you want. So it, it can either be your spouse or your children or depending on the situation. So if it's you and the spouse only minus the children, then you have to at least demonstrate that you have 8 million and above in your account for you to be able to cater for your stay in Australia and all those things. And then of course, remember when you're, do, when you're lodging the visa, if the, the, the visa fee right now for Australia is 65,000, you have to pay 65,000 times two. So then, and then medical is, is 20,000, it's about 20,000 times two. So sometimes the financial beat becomes a challenge. So remember for an individual, you're, you're talking about 1.5 million. For two people, of course, it's going to be more because the, the, the other person also has to have a health insurance. As much as they're not paying the tuition fee, they have to have health insurance, they have to have a ticket, they have to lodge their visa, they have to do medical biometrics. So meaning that the, the, the bill balloons up to in excess of even 2.2 million or 2.5 million or, or even more, depending on the exchange rates or so on and such, such dynamics. And then the issue of bank statement, 8 million sometimes to get sponsor. And remember, even around the sponsorship, you cannot just come to Dennis, even if I have today the 8 million in my account, you cannot just come and tell me randomly that Dennis, I want you to give you to give me your, I want you to give me your bank statement. Unfortunately, that cannot happen because you have to prove how you are related to me. So you have to provide, if I'm your father, then I have to provide my birth certificate, you know, my ID, you provide your birth certificate, my name has to be on your, you know, all that thing. There's the proof of relationship and also I have to prove where I'm getting these funds from. And in most cases, not, not so many people are comfortable to tell people randomly where I got the money, you know. I, I have 8 million in my account, that's my business. I'm willing to give you the dark document, but, but I'm not willing to tell you where I, get the, I got the 8 million from in most cases. So uh, coming into your family is very possible. However, factoring in the financial implication and also the requirements by the government, then it becomes a problem. And also when it comes to, when it comes to the genuine, remember initially when I told you about the statement of purpose, I said that you have to demonstrate that you are coming and you're going to go back to your country. So if you're coming, the both of you, sometimes, sometimes uh, I'm putting there, I'm, I'm saying this uh, very carefully, sometimes, this can be interpreted as you're migrating. There's nothing that is holding you back in your country. So meaning that the, 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 in most cases, um, in most cases, you are not going to go back. So it can also implicate, you know, like negatively impact your visa application. So if they are seeing that all of you are coming out of Kenya, then most likely there's no chance of you going back. But again, as I've said, it's sometimes. Yeah, so that one can affect. So it just depends on how the case officer will interpret your visa application. But uh, over and above, guys, I will just say, getting out of the country, even just not even if it is not necessarily for for the purposes of even just getting the opportunities, it just opens your mind to a lot of other things. You see things differently. Uh, Mama has told us that she has experienced this issue of going to the mall and you just do your own things in an honest way. It is exactly the same thing in Australia. We, we check out our shopping just the same way. Even the bus, there's no one to, to collect fare, even on, on the train. You have your card, it's called a, 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 a go card. You just load it with money and that is done online. When you're getting onto the bus, you just tap it. You get into the bus when you're, when you're leaving, you tap it again and no one is going to monitor you. So, you know, it, it is just, as, uh, even experiencing those things, it's, it's just amazing. So I would always encourage us, as much as we love our country, but at the end of the day, there's so much opportunities out here. Australia currently, Australia, um, I am in Queensland. Queensland is three times the size of, of, of Kenya. The, the, the population of Queensland currently is less than 2 million. And the opportunities are so many. Even if you just Google right now, uh, shortage you know, shortage of employment in Australia, you'll see it is a big issue. Like right now, they really need people to work 
in so many diverse industries. So I think this is the right time for us to take up these opportunities. And remember, unfortunately, we are not the only ones looking for these opportunities. Nigerians are crazy. These people are everywhere. Literally, they are here, they are taking up every opportunity. In fact, Nigerians have gone a step higher than Kenyans. They have even come here and set up companies. So we, we really have to also step up our game. This is at the time to, 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 to you know, like, like just take up these opportunities. The initial investment can look big, but at the end of the day, look at it as an investment. You always invest, and then at some point you'll get returns. It might not come as fast as you would want, but at the end of the day, the returns are going to be there. The returns are the high standard of living. The returns are the opportunity to just be in a place whereby you can constant, you can just work and your work will pay you, you know, in a system whereby actually, you know, that investment can come back in a very short time and you can be able to even do your own projects back at home. Even, and uh, sometimes you don't have to even come and stay here for forever. You can actually come, get the money, get the whatever, the exposure, get the, 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 the knowledge and all these things, set up your stuff back at home. After a certain duration of time, relocate back. You know, no one is stopping you from doing that. But at the end of the day, there are so many opportunities out here and I would encourage people to come and just be here. Uh, someone has asked about uh, which cities are the best to settle in in Canada and Australia. I would say, so long as you're in this country, it doesn't really matter which city you're in. We will guide you best on the availability of your course in a particular state because some universities based in some areas will offer specific, specific courses based on that. Because as I said, the curriculum in Australia is developed based on the place where the, the university is. So like you'll find if that area is an agricultural area or they, 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 they grow wine, you'll get that specific universities that will be offering winery courses and not necessarily in another place where there, there's no wine cultivation or something. I'm just giving that as an example. So they, they're developed based on the needs of that particular place. So you'll find even allocation of courses. You might find education, they have allocated more slots in a certain university, maybe because there's a need there as compared to another place. This is, all these things, they have deliberately made these decisions based on the needs and what uh, they want. So uh, all these cities are good. And uh, I would always encourage, and uh, there's also a rule when I'm helping students to select these courses, I'm also looking at the long term. There are certain cities in Australia when you come, if you want to stay longer, the chances of you staying longer here are going to be reduced. An example is Sydney. Sydney, initially when they were planning Sydney, they only needed uh, 4 million or at most 4 million people. Right now, Sydney, we are heading to 6 million people. They don't want any more people there. So if you're an international student and you go to study in Sydney, there's high chance that even when you're going to get, uh, when you're applying for your graduate visa later on, they're not going to give you more than two years but if, when I'm in Queensland, and because it's a, you know, the, the population is still small and they want people to still come to this area, they're going to give me a longer visa because they want me to stay here. So when you're making those decisions, also look at those uh, circumstances. Like there are cities that have already reached their peak. They are big cities. Cost of living is expensive. As an international student, you don't want to go to a place whereby the cost of living is very high. So you you are looking at. So I would I would encourage you to go to the quote in quote we shall go of, of these countries. But we shall go. You'll be shocked. A place in Eto'o we shall go is super developed. It has perfect tarmac roads, facilities everywhere. I recently visited a public hospital in uh, Sunshine Coast, and I've gone to several other public hospitals because of the nature of work that I do. You look at these facilities and you're just amazed. Public hospitals are like perfect in terms of everything. So go to regional areas, go to places that are at least developed because the chances of you remaining there are higher and the cost of living is also going to be low because you don't want to be spending a lot of money and yet you're going, you're looking for that money. Yeah. So I think 
I will uh, ask my wife to talk about English proficiency, and then I will be going through the other questions. If there's any other question that I haven't answered, I will try and answer them once after my wife has done. And then I will tell you now a bit about our company, so that now you can see how best we can be able to assist you. So, uh, Dali, can you talk about English, please? About English, we have uh, of two kinds. We have, have the academic training. Basically, general training is about um, just having the knowledge of English, which has four, mainly four areas. We have the listening, we have speaking, we have reading and writing. So normally you will be uh, examined in those four areas. For uh, training, it's specifically done which require the, more, the high band. When you talk about the high band, you're talking about uh, numbers of 7.5 to 8. Yeah. And above, that is. Medical courses also have the high requirements of um, 7.5 and above. Uh, of which when we train is not anything hard. Actually, they want just to uh, get your speed of listening or your attention, how attentive you can be, how easy you can get to be when you're being given instructions that is. Reading is all about speed and everything. Okay, those are the things that maybe you get down to know when we start the training part of it. But it's not anything hard. If you are supposed to get an academic training, we will always offer you for three weeks and then book you for your exams. It depends with how flexible you are. So how uh, flexible you are depends with the days that are available. Uh, Centers are in Eldoret, Nairobi, as of now, not sure if in, in Kisumu, but in Eldoret and Nairobi, we have training centers, or not training per se, but examination centers. So once you register for your uh, exams, you can always have it either online or physical which normally I advise learners to be physical because sometimes it can be comes to our... Sorry, Diana, you are breaking. Uh, yeah. Daughter? Electrical appliances. Sorry, sorry, we lost her again. Uh, I, I think, uh, okay. I, I think Dennis, for I, the, for the, for the English tests, uh, let's organize mm -hmm. for a, a day, like what you've taken us through, then we can have Diana uh, prepare for like an hour because it's also something that people need to know so that we are not mm -hmm. rushing over. Then Diana can maybe come in, um, maybe after ne either next week or after next week uh, mm -hmm. so that she can take us through the, the English proficiency test, okay. what is required. Yeah. <laughs> That's fine. So, um, okay, maybe, Mom, allow me just to mention something about that because uh, I, as much as I wanted her to talk about it, uh, mm -hmm. I, 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 I can also try and answer a few things about that. So, someone was asking about the centers. Um, the centers, we, uh, she was trying to tell us that the centers are in Eldoret and uh, Nairobi. And so this is basically, you know, for English, uh, the English proficiency, as I said earlier, 
we have TOEFL, we have PTE, and we have IELTS. So the IELTS, uh, the IELTS test, the IELTS test can be done in Eldoret by it's offered by British Council. So you can just look for British Council, you will see. But then at Mashariki Exposure, that's why I, I wanted to I, I wanted to leave this for the last part where we can be able to guide you on how to whichever, whichever center you want to go to and all these things. So we will help you book your exam, help you prepare for that, that particular exam. And uh, you know, so we'll do all these things for you basically. So we for the for the IELTS, it's done by British Council. For the TOEFL, it's done by Uni, UNISAV. And then we have PTE is done by, I think still UNISAV but that one is done in Nairobi. So IELTS, you can do it either paper-based or online. TOEFL has to be, it's online, but then you do it in a specific center. Same to PTE, you have to do it online, but in a specific center. So TOEFL and PTE in, in, in basic terms are uh, computer-based. IELTS, you can get a paper-based version, but then there's also a computer-based version that uh, came up recently. So that's pretty much about it. And then remember at Mashiriki Exposure, our offices are based in Eldoret. You can be able to assist you in the training and preparation of those exams. So that's pretty much it. Yeah, someone has already shared their British Council and all that. So let me talk about a bit about a medical mom. I hope we're not running out of time. And I also have to be sensitive let's about that. Yeah, let's just continue. Okay, about medical courses, someone has asked about um, uh, medical courses. So what I can tell you for free is that medical courses are highly sought after in most countries abroad. And uh, they, they have a very high rate of return in terms of the first, uh, the entry salary and all these things. And of course, getting a job is gonna be very easy for you. However, as I said, it has, you have to have the medical background, first of all, in Kenya for you to come and do that. And uh, what I normally say, because again, this information also might help not only you here in this platform, but also maybe someone that you might know. What I normally say is it is a waste of money to come and study something like medicine in like Australia or Canada. It's very expensive. It's super, it's super demanding. And remember, we are coming here for the opportunity of also getting this money. So I would not encourage people to do those two courses and dentistry, that is also another thing, and pharmacy. Those are the only courses, medical courses that I will try and discourage people from doing. But if you have the financial muscle, then there's no problem. If you're not the kind of student who is coming to work to raise their tuition fee, for you to be able to sustain yourself here and also wish to maybe invest back at home, then it is okay. You can you can encourage that person or yourself. You can come and do those courses. What I've said is pharmacy, dentistry, medicine. Those ones are courses that I will not encourage people to come and do here because of the entry requirements are very high. The course already is so demanding at its and it's very expensive to study those courses here. So if you're interested in medical courses, nursing, of course, is top on the list. There are other courses that people do not consider, but they are very marketable, like biomedical science, health science, health promotion, um, public health. And the way public health is being taught here is totally different. It's not the way it is being taught in Kenya. I remember myself, I wanted to study public health, and I remember someone telling me, when you want to go to Kuangalia sewage, you know, that is the understanding of public health in Kenya. However, I am I'm currently studying my master of public health here. I'm doing a double master's in math, uh, global public health and global project management. It is also allowed, you can actually do something like that. So I'm doing that and the way they teach here is totally different. We are actually studying aspects of health, not necessarily sewages. And, and, and just inspecting butcheries, how, you know, butcheries are clean and all those things. No, that's public health in Kenya, but here it's basically about health promotion, literally. So those courses are also very important. Uh, someone is talking about tourists. Uh, let me see, I, uh, I'll get that question. But uh, so it, 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 health courses are highly marketable. The other course that people ignore and it's very, very marketable is laboratory related courses. So we are talking about biotech, 
biochem, uh, laboratory science, those ones, those, those courses are highly sought after in Canada and also in Australia. So those are courses that I would always encourage people to do apart from the medicine and maybe even sometimes nursing because some of these courses will have a lower entry requirement to nursing. Yeah, so you can also consider those ones as you're thinking about. Physiotherapy is also a good course. Uh, and you can actually do that. And uh, it's, 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 it's also not very pricey, so that is okay. Some, I saw some question about hospitality. If I'm currently doing a course like hospitality. Yes, you can, you can actually come and do hospitality. Hospitality is also one of those courses. And apparently I was realizing recently that hospitality can give you permanent residency very easily in, in Australia. And even culinary arts, I think maybe food science will also fall into that category. You've uh, I've seen someone has said, culinary arts, uh, chefs, all these people, you get PR very fast when it comes to, when you come to Australia. So hospitality, tourism, because remember, Australia is also marketing itself so much about as a tourist destination. So caregiving, I don't know what you mean about caregiving, but um, I think, uh, as I said, that, that will fall under individual support or social work, then still marketable. So hospitality, very marketable also. And then there's something about KMTC. Let me just answer that real quick. And if there's any other question, please just send them on the chat. I'll be able to see. What if I have a diploma in nursing from KMTC? What do you mean? What, and after that, what happens? What are you looking at? Are you, do you want to come and do? Uh, uh, so in most cases, let me just, th I, I think I understand what your question. If you have a diploma from KMTC, you'll come and do a bachelor's of nursing in Australia. And a bachelor of nursing takes three years. So you, if you've done your diploma in Kenya, sometimes they'll give you credits. But what I normally tell students is that don't see credits when you're in Kenya because it will make your process very lengthy and uh, they will need a lot of other things. So please come to Australia, then seek credits when you are here. However, there's even no need of you seeking credits because if you study for those three years, you're increasing your, 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 your duration of stay in Australia, you're increasing your chances of getting permanent residency because when they're assessing you for permanent residency, they're going to be looking at the duration of time that you stayed here. Um, so basically uh, that is, I think what you might be asking. How many exams will I do to ah, dentistry? I said, I don't encourage people to come and do dentistry, but it's a good course. If you want to do it and you have the financial muscle, well and good, consider it, there's no problem. What of statistics? I will not talk about all the courses, unfortunately, because I'm now seeing people just popping in all courses. I, I cannot talk about all of them. Uh, it just depends. Is, if your background is statistics and, and, math, and, and maths, we will guide you on which course will be best, best on if we start the process. Teaching, I talked about teaching earlier. Uh, maybe some of you missed up, but I said teaching is one of the highly sought after courses in Australia specifically because there's a, an acute shortage of teachers here. Even so if you would, oh, lovely. Yeah. So guys, if you are teachers, this is your time. Just prepare, you know, get your papers ready. We will guide you on uh, a few things, but then for teachers, you have to get very, you have to pass your English proficiency because it has a higher English proficiency requirement as even more than than, than nursing. So for those ones, you have to start from the English point of view. You prepare for English, book, do it, and then um, and then now you can start the process. You have to get a 7.5 out of, we have long, and no Swahili, no, unfortunately. So it, it, these countries are English speaking countries. So just take it from, that's why you have, they want you to, they want to prove that you are English proficient. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can come and do electrical engineering and continue doing it here. That is possible. As I said, initially, 
they will be looking at the continuity of your course from what you did in Kenya and what you what you want to come and do here. So I think I've done I've I've, I've answered most of the questions. Is or someone talked about said uh, I talk a bit about our company. Um, no, you cannot come and do internship here. Unfortunately, you cannot. I don't think the uh, because uh, the qualifications are different. So you you will come and start studying here for you to be able to get internship and even employment opportunities after you've gotten quali uh, qualifications from these countries. So someone talked. Uh, let me talk a bit about our organization. So Mashariki Exposure is uh, the company that we 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 are using. So. Uh, on a, uh, I must say I'm also one of the clients of Mashariki Exposure, despite the fact that I'm, I, I started it myself. So we run it together with my wife. My wife is back in Kenya and our offices are located in Eldoret. Uh, I will share uh, I will share the, the, my wife's number and also maybe my number so that uh, you can be able to you know, get in touch with us if you need the process, but she would be the best person to contact because she's on the ground. But we work hand in hand. I deal with the operations point a bit of the, the company whereby I'm the one who does the visas and all these things by the virtue of my experience. And uh, they do all the other stuff. So they're actually doing even more, but I'm also here to guide them and to guide you on anything that you want on the ground, accommodation issues and everything, because I'm on the ground. So what we do is uh, facilitate the process. As I said, we don't assist students to get scholarship, neither do we work with any scholarship giving bodies. We only deal with self-sponsored students. So you, you will be paying for all these things that you will come. And we also have our service charges so we charge an amount, and of course, I will not mention. I will, I will not want to mention the amount here, but I would wish, if someone will be interested, we will talk about that later. But we have an agency fee that we charge uh, for all students who come and study and, and, and work and, and you know wish to 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 get our services. So, and it's paid in two installments. So we will tell you uh, how, the, how the installments will be paid. So. That's basically our work. We'll help you look at the documents, help you match you with the, with the, with the, with the perfect university for you, uh, guide you on all the issues that are in between you getting an offer letter and, 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 uh, and getting the visa. And personally, I'm the one who handles the visas uh, because of my experience. So I will be able to, I'll, I'll, the one, I'll be the one to go through your documents and all these things. But I have a very dedicated and competent team at, on the ground that can be able to guide you in everything. We do the English training in, in our office. We, as I said, you don't have to worry about anything when you come to us. Even those issues of uh, you know passports and all those things, we can be able to guide you if you wish to. Uh, but again, passports, you can just do it in the cyber, get the passports and all that. But if you wish to you know, get guidance, we can be able to assist you on that. So we try as much as possible to help our clients, you know, like end to end. So you have already, gotten your visa you are planning to travel we are going to assist you in booking the tickets you know trying to see best accommodation options for you and especially for those people who are coming to australia and now that we have a link uh, through madam Kristen uh, in canada I, I i don't know if uh, i'm putting you on the spot ma'am but you know we can be able to see how best you can be able to assist even in advising on just how to get accommodation facilities. So basically, we do end-to-end -end kind of a service in at Mashariki Exposure. That's basically it. And we called it Mashariki Exposure because uh, there's one pastor who told me that all good things come from the East. The wise men came from the East. The sun rises from the East. So Mashariki is East. So, and then exposure, we just want you to, we want people to just know that there's greater opportunities beyond what you can even think about. Myself, I didn't even know that people go out to study. Apparently, a few of my friends finished campus immediately. They started this process. I didn't know until I started working in the, in the, in the, in the industry. And it's through that exposure that I was able to understand a lot of things and know a lot of things 
And I was privileged enough even before coming to Australia now for a long term duration, I had come here twice before. And that exposure really opened up my mind to see that there's a lot of possibilities out there. And that's basically why Mashariki Exposure was born so that we can bring these good things to people. And that's why we are willing to you know, share with this information with as many people as possible. Because at the end of the day, if we can be able to change someone's life by just sharing this, uh, this information with you or helping you and facilitating that process, then we have already achieved our purpose and dream and desire here. So that's basically what we do. And I will share my wife's number so that you can be able to communicate to her and uh, she will be able to guide you all of whoever is interested. She will give you the requirements, all these things she'll be able to guide you on. Yeah, so that's basically about Mashariki exposure. And then uh, someone asked about English proficiency. Yes, that, that test expires. Most cases, it's two years. After two years from the date of doing it, it will expire. But if you do it and come with it to, you know, it only expires, honestly, if you do it and you don't do anything about it in Kenya. For instance, you did it in 2019. Right now, you cannot use it for anything. But if you do it in 2022, and immediately you come to Australia, then you can still use it for a longer time. Most institutions and employers will accept it even beyond the expiry date, just by the virtual fact that you have it. But if you do it and stay with it back at home, then it's not gonna, it's, of course the expiry date will, will, will affect you, yeah. Yeah, thank you very Are much. There... Oh, sorry, oh, you're still on, continue. No, I just wanted to ask if there are any other questions because I think I've answered most of the of the questions that were put on the chat. So maybe I'll take it back to you, ma'am. Thank you very much, my son. Uh, the reason as to why he's calling me mom is because he married my daughter. Diana was my high school student and the, one of the best students I had back then in the year... Uh, Dana uh, did Form 4 in 1990. Was it 99? When did uh, Dana? It was back, back, back in 2010. I, I, yeah, I 2010, sorry. yeah, 2010. Yeah, yes, 2010. Yeah. 2010 yes. yeah. yeah, that was 2010. I'm talking about 1999, and I'd not even started teaching. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that was St. Mary's Mumia's girls, and I really treasure my students from the time I started working, and uh, that is why you can see we are still in a relationship up to now. So that is why I usually don't lose touch of my students, because I know there is something that have Im impacted in you that can help me, can help you, and can help us work together to transform our country. Thank you very much, Dennis. Thank you very mm -hmm. much, uh, Diana. We'll be engaging Diana more because she's in Kenya. We don't want to keep on waking you up at one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so no, there's no problem. There, there, there's no problem, mommy. Continue, continue engaging with us on our Sunday meetings because we want to make this like a habit uh, for us to mm. meet every Sunday. Unfortunately, we uh, the link that I have has a limited number of 100. So I also need to ask the members later on if we can be able to purchase a, a link that can accommodate a thousand people. I'm seeing so many people who are left outside hanging. So what I will do, I will share the, I'll share the recording because I've been recording in my, in my whatever on my laptop. I'll share the recording so that those who didn't join the meeting can be able to, to follow what we did. So maybe just give uh, Diana's number verbally. Diana, you can give out your phone number so that people can start reaching out to you. I've shared it on the chat, so, but it. again, you can, you can just repeat. There's no problem for those people who just want to write it right now, or save it right now. Yeah, because of the recording. I can even yeah, because of the recording and people will be listening to the recording, just okay. say it out. So Diana's number is uh, 0724 
0724411221. She's a student yes. that I have taught. She's born again. Uh, we are not doing this to, 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 as in to, to exploit anyone. We just want to assist you because it's a mm. company that is already in, uh, in, in, in whatever, in working. Yeah, it's a company that is already working and they know everything. You know, Mimi Nile Kutapa Tapa. The way I did it, I will, I'll guide you, oh, this is what I did, this is what I did. But you can see the way Dennis has taken us through the procedures, actually what we need to have, how we need to acquire it, how we will move on. So they'll be able to help you step by step. Uh, to be honest, I did my IELTS test in 2019 when uh, some agent was trying to cheat me. In fact, I told you I was conned all, over 600,000 shillings. Uh, I did my IELTS the test then. I, I did not get the, the band that was needed. I repeated the test. I scored the band, but by the time I'm scoring the band, other things have been overtaken by time. So these guys just mm -hmm. took my money like that. So uh, because it expired, this time round, when I was coming to Canada, I had to do the IELTS exam again. And uh, believe me, you cannot just go to the exam room and pass. You have to be trained. You have to be trained on how to go about all those, all those tests. So that is why Diana comes in very handy to help us uh, be able to overcome that, that whatever. Because when you're doing the exam, you're paying a lot of money. Back then, yeah, I was yeah. paying 20, it was about 20,000 for IELTS. Uh, in March, in February, when I was doing the IELTS test, it had already gone shoot to 28,000 shillings. So I, I don't know. It is something that you right need, now. yeah, to prepare well for so that you don't keep on wasting, wasting your money. Mm. Yeah. So uh, I think up to where we've reached, uh, it's now 32. Yeah, Maureen is saying it's now 32K. Oh my God. Yes. 30,000. 30,000. It is, it, yeah, it is expensive. So you have to be prepared. You have to yeah, have somebody have with the to knowledge to yeah. help you know how to, lead, to, 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 to respond to the listening questions, how to listen fast not just answering the questions, how to do the listening and the way they, the, the questions come and the best way you can respond for you to get that high band. Uh, you, you will not just go in like what you know. I am, I am a teacher of English and literature and I thought it is something very simple because I, I, did, I did English and literature up to including university and beyond. And I even have a doctorate, you know, I'm like, yeah, but you have to be trained. You have to be trained. So if it is you or your child who is interested to study abroad, you now have the tips and we will continue supporting you. We'll continue helping you to know how best. Let me tell you, this is the best decision I ever made in my life. And I'm so happy about it. As much as I'm struggling in the initial months, that is why I was trying to shout, oh, please help me uh, contribute something for my fees because my fees uh, for my course, it's, it takes uh, 2 million per year. So I've already paid 1 million. I am like, I have to raise the, the, the next 1 million for uh, before, before 1st of May. That is why I was like, I don't have any shortcut. I cannot work within 20 days if I get any job to raise that amount of money. I'm happy to learn that in Australia, you can go to Australia three months before and you're allowed to work. In Canada, if your study permit is attached, your work permit is attached to your study permit, you are not allowed to work until you start studying. So I cannot re work at the moment until 1st of May. You can be sure the way I'll be running up and down collecting those dollars. So... <laughs> That is why, that is why I, I was like, can't my friends help me, yeah? So if you still uh, think you can still join my group to assist me raise the, the fee, 
100 shilling, 200, 500, 1,000, whatever is appreciated because the amount will not in reduce, it will continue increasing and I'll be able to get my target by first of, uh, of May. Otherwise, I want to say thank you very much for coming into the room. I'll also think about how best to have a meet a, a room that can accommodate a thousand a thousand people, because that one I have to pay like sixteen thousands for every month. Uh, I just took this one for a hundred people because I can't afford at the moment. I can't afford to raise the sixteen thousands because I'm not in any payroll. So. If you can also think about if you, you have a link that can accommodate a thousand people, we can still use your link. We can still use your link to have many people in the house. So we only got to a limit of a hundred people uh, because of the limit of the link that I, I purchased. Otherwise, Mbariki Wesana. And because my daughter is... Uh, is a strong believer and uh, she's saved and she believes in God. I want to request her to pray for us so that we can finish, we can wind up our meeting. Can you try Google, please? Google? The challenge, the only challenge with Google. Can you try Google Meet? Yeah, the only challenge with Google Meet, you have to have a Gmail account and not everybody has a Gmail account. That is why Zoom is more, as in it is more friendlier. Even the features of Zoom are, are actually the best for any large meeting. But we can, we can try Google, we see how many will join the meeting. Yeah, thank you very much. Diana, can you pray for us? And then I will also, I'll also have a friend, Anne is here with us. Uh, she can also assist us in sign language because I don't want to leave the special needs uh, behind. Eh? So I'll also request Anne at some point to assist us with sign language so that nobody is left behind. So that it is all inclusive. Hey, Nina Wapenda, Asanteni Sana, Celine, Augustine, Charles, Pamela, Sarah, Nancy, Kennedy, Mary, Rose, Joshua, Emma, everybody, George, Adamaris, uh, really, my God, God bless you for, for being positive and joining this meeting. I hope you have been blessed. And remember, when you are blessed, it is not for you. You are blessed to be a blessing. Next time, come with someone. Let them learn. Because what I know, knowledge is non-rivalry. Even if you yes. fight me how, you will not get, you will not take what I have. I have it. So when I'm sharing, I'm also learning. I'm increasing in getting more information. But if you stick to what you know, you will remain with that and uh, you will never grow. So that is why I usually open my hands and say, GL, GL, give love, get love. So if you have your hands open, you give, you will also get back. So may God bless you. Diana, please pray for us. Daughter. As she went. Okay, let's all believe and pray. Let's all believe and pray. Dear Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you, we honor you, give you glory, honor, and adoration, Lord, for this wonderful time that you've given us together, Lord, as your sons and daughters. This evening, we just want to be grateful unto you because... Father, in your word, it's been said that, Lord, we knock and the door shall be opened unto us. We seek and we shall find. My Father, this evening, we are here to seek and to know, to know, Lord, more of which what you want us to achieve at the end of our lives, to achieve our purposes, to get our vision straight, Lord. And through this meeting, dear Lord, we pray that most of these are visions and most of these goals may be achieved even through our meetings, Lord. May we have an opportunity to gain more knowledge even within ourselves. May we have a an understanding of whatever we are sharing together, my Redeemer. And Father, for those who are even uh, uh, 
desiring to go out and study, desiring to go out and make a beautiful life. Father, we pray that you may open doors because where there is a vision, my Father, there is always provision. Provide for each and every one of us. Lord, we pray that our families may be strong, found in your love and in your favor, King of glory. May we find even favors before our friends, before our families, King of glory. And whatever that we've discussed here, my Father, may it be unto your glory, may it be unto your honor, my Redeemer. Bless each and, each and every one of us in our various destinations. Be a blessing to each and every house that has been represented this day in this place, my Father. And we know that, Father, at the end of it all, all glory and honor shall be unto you. We give glory we give thanks for this we pray believing and trusting in the mighty name of jesus christ amen 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 we are eating lunch <laughs> god bless God bless you. Thank you so much. All right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Let me go to bed now. Oh, you. Night. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Let me see you. So. Thank <sighs> you.